Let's start in verse 9 of chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 9. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Now, most of the modern translations translate the Hebrew as contend with, or bring charges against you, or state my case against you, rather than what we have here in the authorized version, plead. Well, of course, contend seems to suggest and imply that Jeremiah is simply presenting the people in Jerusalem with a list of sins that God has against them, that he is going to bring this list to them and charge them. And as one commentator remarks, the word is a legal word which indicates that the Lord has a charge to bring against his people. Indeed, the whole of chapter 2 can be read as the transcript of a court case. The Lord is the plaintiff. He accuses his people of blatant infidelity. He itemizes their crime and, like a skillful prosecuting counsel, anticipates and dismisses their pleas of innocence. Well, the translators of the authorized version have taken into account the context, immediate, as well as the larger context, and in so doing, they've rendered the Hebrew word as plead, which provides a far more natural understanding of what follows as you read on in Jeremiah. Jeremiah is about to plead with the people. But how could such translation committees get it so wrong? Well, I'm not going to even attempt to answer that, but instead I'm going to quote from Matthew Henry as he comments on this verse. Before God punishes sinners, he pleads with them to bring them to repentance. Those that deal with sinners for their conviction must urge a variety of arguments and follow their blow. God had before pleaded with their fathers and asked why they walked after vanity and became vain. Now he pleads with those who persisted in that vain conversation received by tradition from their fathers and with their children's children, that is, with all that in every age tread in their steps. A more modern commentator was prepared to write, young Jeremiah started his ministry with messages that were courageous, compassionate, and convicting. Well, there's just far too much reasoning and appealing. There's far too much remonstrating and argument as you go through, particularly the early chapters of Jeremiah, for him simply to be acting as the Lord's prosecutor, reading the charges. Jeremiah uses so many illustrations, employs many graphic pictures, is clearly pleading. It's obvious that he is seeking to persuade and bring to repentance. He employs searching questions. He gives wonderful illustrations. Not what you would find with a prosecuting counsel. Far from it. Well, before turning to some passages, I need to correct one further and common misunderstanding about Jeremiah. A quote from a well-known study Bible. The main theme of Jeremiah is judgment upon Judah, chapters 1 to 29. Since God's judgment was imminent, he concentrated on current problems as he sought to turn the nation back from the point of no return. The nation? Really? But Jeremiah knows that what he is going to say and what he says is never going to bring Jerusalem, never going to turn the nation back to repentance and away from judgment. And yet he continues to remonstrate, he continues to reason, he continues to argue. Why? Well, the reason it concerns us is this, because he is seeking to reach individuals. He's coming in a personal way and seeking to persuade individuals that are going to hear him. And therefore, his reasoning, his argumentation, with the blessing of God, he looks to and prays, will reach the hearts and minds of some of those individuals in Jerusalem, bring them under conviction of sin and lead them to true repentance. Well, let's now look at a number of verses. And my brief from Dr. Masters was to work through some passages in a kind of workshop-style fashion. That's very time-consuming. So I will not be reading the verses. I'll refer you, point you to the verses. But to save time, I won't read them out. You will forgive me if I slip into preaching mode, won't you? You will understand that if I start to speak to you as if you're all unbelievers, it's, it's just the material. I'm far happier at being a preacher. 
So please forgive me if I do that. Let's begin in chapter 2. Verse 5. And I'm just going to give you some verses, explain a little of Jeremiah and what he has in mind and why he's saying it, and then some application and how we would apply it. So chapter 2, verse 5. Having reminded them how the Lord had blessed them in former days and how they had responded to the Lord, Jeremiah asked, basically, what wrong has God inflicted upon you? What has God ever required of you that was unreasonable? What harm has he ever brought upon you that you can justify the way you are, your actions? What has he ever done that can explain why you've turned away from him? And we can use similar reasoning, can we not, to people. The goodness of God, his kindness, the generosity of the Lord. What has he given us? Why, even the law of God enshrined in the Ten Commandments is a great kindness and wonderfully protective. Verse 6. When the Lord had to withdraw his blessings because of sin, the people's response was not to ask why, not to question, well, what has caused God to withdraw his blessings from us. They didn't consider themselves to be the cause. They needed to repent. They needed to return to the Lord in obedience, but they never asked, well, what was the cause? Could it be us? Instead, they sought out other gods. That was their response. And they kept changing and moving ever further away from the Lord. Well, here in the UK, though there are overseas visitors with us, but different parts of the United Kingdom over the past centuries have been so blessed by the Lord We can point to deliverances. We can point to revivals. Why, we can even point out in not too distant history days of prayer when there was at least some recognition on the part of many in the land that they needed to come to the Lord, that they were dependent upon the Lord and they were seeking his help, his intervention and so on. We can look at the many great institutions that have been in this land hospitals, schools, benevolent organizations, as well as the original foundation upon which many of our laws and legal system was built. And now? Well, what is happening now? What is it that we see now? Are the right questions being asked? Why? What's the cause? What's, what has brought all this upon us? Or do we just maintain as a land the momentum of change And in that momentum, we just move further and further away from the Lord and his law. Verse 7 and verse 8. Well, Jeremiah distinguishes between four different classes of spiritual leaders and says none of them have sought to bring the people back. In fact, they've given their support to the constant changes and moving away from the old paths. Well, you surely don't need me to point out the obvious reason and application to our day. Verse 10 through to 12, the reasoning continues. Jeremiah, as it were, says, this is unbelievable. This is something that has never been known. Can you find anywhere such a thing as this, that a nation has changed its gods, given up, turned away, and come and adopted others? No other nation, he's saying, would do such a thing. They're not gods at all. Uh, in any way, shape or fashion. They don't exist. They've never worked any wonders on behalf of the people who they apparently belong to. They've never delivered the people in times of invasion or in times of trouble. And yet they're devoted to them, these people in the surrounding nations. They honor them. They fear offending them. And here you are, a people who have given up and exchanged the true God for no gods. What an exchange, he seems to exclaim. They have irrefutable evidence in their history, as well as in their recent history, of a living and almighty God who hears and answers prayer. And yet when in trouble, when things turn for the worse, instead of turning to the Lord, they go out after other gods. Other gods who have proved useless, 
proved to be powerless. And Jeremiah even here personifies the heavens to make his point that what the people have done is so astonishing, so unreasonable. Well, we have, through the means of modern technology, access to the world today. And what do we find as we access the world on our computers? We find people and nations scattered throughout who are loyal to their gods, loyal to their faiths. And so we will continue to show the bankruptcy of what people look to and trust in in these days. The failure of their faith in materialism, secularism, naturalism, and so on. And, of course, the proven power of Almighty God. Verse 13. What a beautiful and a powerful illustration this is. God describes himself as the fountain of living waters and contrasts this with what the people prefer. Fountain. Well, of course, in those days, a fountain was something special. It was a source of water. It was a continuous supply of water. It would continually be gushing forth. Cisterns, he speaks of here, and that comes from the root, to dig, or to bore a pit or a hole. And these cisterns, they were dug out of impervious clay or rock, and they were filled with water, using various ducts and drains. They were often shaped in a kind of pear shape, enabling a small opening at the top, which would then possibly be put, uh, have a cover put over it. You will recall that Jeremiah himself was put into one as a dungeon. And there were 70 murdered men were thrown into an old one. So they could be quite sizable things. Even so, they were notoriously unreliable. Even when they were lined, as they were often so lined with certain material, or they, even then they were prone to leaking. And uh, they would crack due to movement of the ground. And therefore, they would split, and therefore, the water would seep away and drain away. And so, Jeremiah is asking, why do you go to all that work? The digging up of the ground, the ducts, and so on, to bring in the water, a cover on top, having to refill so often because of all the leaks. Why go to all that work when there's a fountain or a spring of living water? that is available? Well, our lives, the course we take in our lives, how we follow one course or another course. And what Jeremiah says is puzzling. Yet this is how it is with us. We go for the system every time as unbelievers. We follow the course of relying upon ourselves, providing for ourselves. We work, we toil, we put effort in. We have self-determination. It's about what we can achieve. It's about what we want, what we can get. And even as we follow this course, all the while we're ignoring the Lord and his blessings of salvation. We can speak of the system of our life. It's difficult. It's unreliable. It's disappointing. It cannot seem to hold on to happiness. We can't seem to hold on and grasp securely contentment, joys. They just leak away. Or oh, one minute we're over the moon, one minute we're rejoicing, one minute we're happy. Oh, but it has a tendency to seep away. Some circumstance change. Something else comes into our life, and all oh, that just seems to seep away and go away. Such constant effort and hard work to get a grain of satisfaction and contentment from this world, it's both a hard and foolish way to proceed. But that's how it is with us as unbelievers. We slave to make something last, and so often we end up with rather less than we had wanted. We want to hold on to our dreams and our aspirations, but they so often slip away. And the final disappointment, it all leaks away forever. We can't even hold on to our life itself. The fountain of living water. There was nothing so treasured in those days in terms of a barren and arid landscape. It was like there, a beautiful spring. You always knew when there was one around because the landscape changed where it was. There was rich and lush vegetation. 
There was fauna and flora. There was life and beauty. Oh, such a contrast to outside where the spring was. It was arid and barren. The spring, of course, was necessary for life. It was a source of unending and pure and free water. There was peace of mind because it was reliable. What a beautiful picture of Christ. What a wonderful way we have by using this to speak of him. The blessings that are there in Christ when we turn to him and he converts the soul. Oh, the blessings of Christ. Forgiveness, pardon, new life, adoption. Oh, it's freely available to needy sinners. His mercy and forgiveness flow freely from him. The vilest offender that truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. We would speak of drinking, responding to thirst, drink, believe him, trust him. And as you do, you begin to understand and enjoy the soul is refreshed. And what is the world? Well, the world is a broken system. Why, we would ask, why would you go for that, invest in that, when you can't hold on to the things that it offers? When there is the Lord, he's near and you can know him and you can have an unending source of supplies and blessings and you contrast the believer with the unbeliever just as where the spring is, such a contrast to the surrounding landscape. Verse 14 through to verse 22. I'm assuming that you are familiar with the background of Jeremiah and these places. You'd want to briefly, I suggest, refer to the historical situation. Manasseh had been king for a long time, and the people were far from the Lord, having abandoned his ways, greatly influenced by the nations that surrounded them, following their customs, following their practices. And Israel had been created as a free nation, and yet by forsaking the Lord, they had become slaves. And now the enemy is on their doorstep, roaring, about to take them. And so we can bring in the fact that the influence of others, the power of their example, is something to be considered and thought of in our day. Authorities, authority figures, the rich and the powerful, and how within a relatively short period of time, morals change. Ethics change, standards change, values change, change in an individual. Even within our lifetime, such things can happen and have happened. And there are many things that are accepted today, countenanced today, that not too many years ago were completely unacceptable, frowned upon, and even strongly rejected, particularly with what is now the older generation. And there's good appeals to them on this. It reveals what? Lack of principles. Why have you changed? The standards, well, they're in a state of flux. There's absence of conviction. Otherwise, you wouldn't have gone away and changed. How easy it is to have our minds changed. The power of advertising. How quickly we can get carried along with the changing tide of public opinion and the PC police that always seems to be breathing down our necks, watching over our shoulders. We're always wanting to have what others want, just as Israel wanted what the surrounding nations had. We're naturally jealous, envious, covetous. It's in us, part of the fallen nature, and we can be relatively content with our lot until we see somebody who has something bigger, something better, something that is desirable as far as we're concerned. We're in the grip of such sins, and they're powerful sins. And we put up little resistance. Oh gosh, you can see that today. Little resistance, the sweeping moral changes that have occurred in the last five years. Yes, these are powerful sins. And we capitulate all too easy. But like Jeremiah says in verse 17 to the people, it's what we want. We get what we want. In verse 20, the first part, and here he graphically illustrates what God had done for them. He delivered them from Egypt. 
and from bondage. And at first, they were thankful to some extent. They were grateful to the Lord, even ready to make some promises, but it didn't last because they were still slaves to sin. <clears throat> well, here is an opportunity for us to deal with the yoke and the bondage of sin. We don't realize just how controlling it is, how heavy its demands are, how ruinous it is to our soul's health. It's heavy, it's costly in so many ways. We're able to reveal the ingratitude, the unreasonableness of sin against such a good and kind and benevolent God. It's an opportunity to show how the yoke of the Lord is so very different. Oh, his yoke is easy. The burden is light. It's what we willingly put on and so on. Perhaps in our congregation we may have some particularly elderly people. We can bring out how they were brought up to think and know differently. Oh, but they've been swept along with the current changes. Where is that gratitude now in them? Where is the appreciation, the valuing of what God has done and given? We may also be able to bring out that there are some who have had a measure of light. They know the gospel. Perhaps they've been attending gospel services for many months, many years. Perhaps they have had some sense of sin, come under some kind of conviction. They've spoken of some personal, but not a saving, but a personal deliverance from some difficulty, some crisis in their life. And here they are. They were ready to give themselves to the Lord. And they promised the Lord certain things. They believed, they considered that they had repented and they'd prayed and had gratitude in their heart towards God at that particular time. But what now? Where are they now? What is there in their life now? What or whose yoke have they been wearing? Who or what are they bound to, enslaved to? And of course, we can illustrate the different kinds of yoke, cultural, religious, and so on. And staying with the first part of verse 20. It's as if the Lord cannot understand why they should have turned their backs on him, casting him aside, becoming indifferent and ungrateful to all his blessings and care. Whatever they might say in the second part of verse 20, the truth is seen. It's seen all around them, the high places, the idols, so though they're saying one thing with their lips, the truth is seen with the eyes. And we can speak of the pain to the Lord to see such wholesale abandonment of him for the gods of the world, pleasure, entertainment, money, possessions, self. We can expose sin's impotency, the misery of sin, the disappointment, its temporary and ultimately or oh, unsatisfying nature. What are they? compared with the blessings of God. There's no comparison. And we want to bring out how we have spurned him and spurned his grace to his face. To his face we have done that, regardless of his goodness, regardless of his kindness and generosity. We've said, as it were, I will not serve thee. I'm not under obligation. I am my own boss. Destiny is in my own hands. I believe in self-determination. I have my own standards. Wonderful opportunity here for heartfelt appeals as you come into verse 21 and another illustration. Even though sin has always been there, there is such deterioration from how they began. They haven't stood still. They haven't been improving. They've been deteriorating. Shift in values, standards. Right is now wrong. Wrong is now right. The gifts, the one's faculties and capacities, or possibly Christian influence when they were young. But look at their character. Look at their life. Look at their attitudes now. So far away from what had promised, humanly speaking. They've come to accept far less than what they had in view when they first began. There's willful sin. Depraved nature, such loss of character. Verse 22. Nitre, probably what we would have as washing soda. Well, the Egyptians used it for linen. 
and they would also, this is not a recommendation, they would also mix it with vinegar for toothache. At first, before sin and idolatry were so embedded, well, Judah would come and confess and know cleansing. Oh, but now it's so ingrained within them, so persistent that though they might try and wash their hands of guilt, it's unsuccessful. Oh, the deep nature of sin. It's guilt, the stain, the guilt. The only way to get rid of the stain of guilt, to be washed, to be cleansed, to be purged, one must go to Christ for cleansing and washing clean. Well, we have cosmetic surgery today. It's a big thing. It's used by many. Oh, it's, if you like, an advancement, the modern of the soda and the soap, the makeovers, the extreme makeovers. So people make drastic changes in some areas of their life. They will say, oh, I will be happier now. I've never felt so good. Things are going well for me now. But the reforms, the makeovers, the changes, they're of no use. All they do really is gloss over what is wrong. It keeps the underlying condition concealed for a while. But the root is there. It's left. The stain, a mark before God, it's all there remaining. It's all too superficial. It's just a temporary thing. The effects wear off. We need to have top-ups in order to keep it going and to keep it concealed. The radical nature we would bring out of God's work in conversion. Verse 23 and 24. The camel. <clears throat> well, I know at least one person in the tabernacle who has experience of camels. Strong animal of burden. The larger Bactrian was able to carry up to 450 kilograms. To anyone my age, that's 1,000 pounds. It's been known to carry a rider over 100 miles in 13 hours. And though it can drink considerable amounts of water, up to 200 liters in a day, it hardly sweats. And this helps it, enable, helps it to enable it to go without water for many weeks when that is necessary. But while they are the most useful of animals, beasts of burden, they need to be restrained. For the most part, they remain intractable and bad-tempered, particularly the males. They can be very obstinate. They smell, they spit, and are very moody. And for all its usefulness, the camel is easily distracted. It's not known for being particularly intelligent. And here we are, here is man been endowed with so many gifts and faculties and capacities. By virtue of his makeup, there is so much that he can do, but he must be restrained. He must be kept in check all the time, whether by self or society. And beneath the facade, oh, he's always breaking loose. The sins of the heart, though often they are concealed from view, as well as all the outward sins. Often a person who, for the most part, may be teachable and open when it comes to the gospel, well, they become obstinate with a determination to resist that seems out of character. Then there are intelligent people, people who are usually rational, unable to think logically, but when it comes to spiritual truths and realities and the matter of God, their rationality and their logical thought processes seem to desert them. They become different people. Man is swift in pursuing sin, but not in the Lord and his ways. Man is forever breaking down God's standards and rules. He sneers, he spits at measures to curb his freedom to sin and to be lawless. He's easily distracted from spiritual realities and a sense of urgency to seek the Lord. So easily distracted. Verse 24, the wild ass, untamed. Accustomed to the wilderness, it knows nothing else. It's driven by uncontrollable desires, and yet it ends up being used and discarded. And as a result, it suffers the consequences, such as captivity and being mistreated, overloaded, and left tied up for hours. Well, man only knows life without the Lord. We're fallen creatures. A man is prey to all kinds of temptations, particularly the lusts and sensuous ones, 
He thinks there's fun and satisfaction in the world, but actually it is man who ends up being used and discarded. Yet time and time again, he returns to the world, only to be left to bear the consequences. Pain, guilt, disappointment, the realization that it was not quite what he expected. It was temporary, it was short-lived. The world is very user-friendly, but actually we are being used. We are captivated by the glitz and glamour and what appeals to the baser instincts. But we've been made for higher purposes, to know the Lord. Chapter 5. Verse 1. It's as if the people have questioned God's description of them and the way he depicts them. Jeremiah here speaks as if they've been protesting their innocence saying that they're not as bad as they have been portrayed, and therefore they do not deserve such punishment. He tells them to go anywhere and everywhere to make a thorough search, to see if they can find just one person who is upright and seeks the truth about God and life and what God requires. Find just one, and pardon would be granted, it would be given. Well, here's the universality of sin and the fall of man and total depravity. The scripture provides us with the only true picture of man, with a comprehensive analysis of man. There are none righteous, no, not one. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In verse 2, even though they have fine sound in religious and pious phrases upon their lips, it's merely a cloak concealing the sinful heart. Well, here in this country, even within Christendom, there is so much pride and arrogance. Fine words from people are meant to convince and draw attention away from the reality. There's so much outward and external religion, even in our day, with ceremonies and both formality and informality. So much works righteousness, but no grasp of the holiness of God. Much effort and cries of pleasing God, but it's all so often just a form of godliness, but denying its power. Verse 3, they are so clearly in denial about their sin, and people will always underestimate their sin. It's hardly ever that serious. What's the big deal? What's the fuss? Though, of course, they are very quick at realizing that there's wrongdoing in others and quick to point it out. What they may own up to, well, that's usually the small things, but they don't see the deep things, the deep sins of the heart and own them. And in doing so, they don't understand why God should view them any differently from the way that they view themselves. Verse four and five. And again, it's as if Jeremiah picks up on what some are saying to him by way of response to his preaching. They reluctantly admit that there are some who might fit the picture he is painting, but it's certainly not them. You're not painting us. You're not describing us. No, he's describing the poor, the less educated, the disadvantaged people in society. So Jeremiah seems to say, well, actually, that's not true, but for argument's sake, I'll let it stand for a moment. I'll go to the educated. I'll go to the world train, to the scholars and the leaders in religion, and see if your argument stands up. And he seems to come back and say, no, it doesn't. It doesn't stand up. Well, sadly, we're not short of illustrations to bring concerning this. The cover-ups in our country over the past few years, the denials, the cheating from those in power and who have positions of responsibility, Education and power will often provide just more resources, more opportunities to conceal what is open and blatant in others with less influence and power. Well, I must move on. Let's come uh, into another chapter. Chapter 6. And verse 1. If you have a chapter heading, it might lead you to think that these are instructions or military reminders to the people concerning the procedure that should be uh, uh, brought in 
or when there is a national emergency. But of course, that's not the case. Notice the order of instruction here. Flee, blow the trumpet in Tekoa, light the beacon fire in Bath Hakara. But of course, that was a very foolish way to respond to an approaching enemy, particularly an enemy that is approaching from the north. It was a complete reversal of the usual and correct procedure. And so Jeremiah is saying what is going to happen is so inevitable that all defenseless are useless. He's saying you've ignored the warnings of God, the warnings that God has given through his prophets, and you've continued in your sinful and idolatrous ways. You've repeatedly been told by God's servants that the power and deliverance for you is for you to turn to the Lord in genuine and humble repentance. He says, you've taken no precautions. I suggest that as the enemy approaches, you head north into their arms. Perhaps they'll be merciful to you, though of course they were not known to be merciful. And as you flee into their arms, just set off all the alarms. Well, man, of course, reason and logic tell us that there is one true God. And our observation and experience provides us with some knowledge of what he is like, with a sense that we're creatures and accountable conscience and the witness that God has provided and planted within our soul testifies to us also. We feel guilt, we know shame, and so on. And then there are the warnings brought to us in the form of a crisis or some upset in our life that stops us in our tracks and causes us to have personal reflection. There's the teaching of the scripture. There are Christians who might come alongside. There's the preaching of the gospel. And yet for all this, man continues. There's gross inconsistency. Man takes many precautions in his life that reason and logic lead them to take. We take out a building and a contents insurance for our house. If we have a 12-year-old or even older car, we might decide that it's reasonable and right to be a member of the AA or RAC. Or perhaps because we're self-employed to some, have some additional health insurance. And yet no precautions. No action for their soul. And often the attitude is, well, I'll be all right. I'm still young. There's no defenses against the enemy of the soul. No precautions taken for the coming day of judgment. And I'll close with verse 2 and 5. A different illustration and a line of reasoning. A very odd and curious one. What's going on? What's with the woman? The shepherds, the field. Well, this woman is from the city. She's a wealthy woman, beautifully attired, delicate. She's accustomed to living in a palace with many fine and beautiful things. Her every need is catered for. Her every desire is granted. She wants for nothing, yet here she is. She's left the safety of her palace. She's gone out of the city with no one accompanying her. And she's pitched a tent in one of the distant fields and is now surrounded by these shepherds. Well, this was a stupid thing to do. It was a foolish thing to do in those days of cruelty, even more so with the enemy making their way south. What possessed her to do such a thing? What was she thinking? Could she actually live safely and unmolested in this way, removed as she was from the safety of her home and the city? She was so vulnerable now, and she only has herself to blame, and Jeremiah makes it clear here that the shepherds will take full advantage of her situation. They're already planning what they're going to do to her. Well, of course, it's madness to live in spiritual complacency. The soul is exposed to the forces in this world, set upon and molested by the forces of sin and Satan. Our character, our integrity, and so on are harmed and molested at every turn. Spiritual complacency exposes us to all the world's propaganda. We can name the sins we're surrounded by, pray to and attack by selfishness, for example, and we succumb to it. We start off in this world selfish enough, but we become more self-centered, lovers of self, increasing in self-esteem. We become more greedy and place ourselves at the mercy of appetites, deceitfulness, dishonesty, covetousness, and so on. We can describe how the world taunts and affects everyone. And as the years pass, we grow worse. And we can explain and show how the unprotected soul is prey to 
and set upon and ravaged and ruined by the forces and powers of this world. And through the witness of the Spirit as we name the sins, they will resonate in the minds of the hearers and be recognized, bringing them to say to themselves, yes, this is true. This is true of me, true in my life. Well, my time is up. I remember what Dr. Master said with uh, a certain speaker last year, and he's a doctor, so I don't want to push it. I hope it's been helpful, and to some extent, you who engage in regular gospel preaching, I hope it's at least stirred you up to come and consider Jeremiah's gospel. We need to have feeling. We need to feel for the people that we come and address. We need to reason with them. We need to persuade them of the things that are there that they are unaware of. And we need to look to the Lord. We're dependent upon him, that he will bless our work, our preaching the work of the gospel, and with the work of the Spirit in the hearts, bring to conviction and grant repentance and faith unto salvation. But it's a grand work. It's a work that we must be engaged in, as I'm sure we will hear.